of entering manhood come with unique challenges for racialized youth who do so in the context of systemic oppression and racism. Being mindful of this intersection between masculinity and racial injustice can inform violence prevention initiative that address the lived experience of minority male identified youth. Black, indigenous, and other racialized scholar, writer, and artists such as Bell Hooks, Robert Alexander Ines, Audre Lorde, and many others have gifted us with ample tools to work towards understanding the meaning of masculinities for racialized community and racialized youth. We are grateful to carry these with us here in our work and beyond. Also, with en enormous support from our partners, Albion Neighborhood Services, we can implement this unique project seeking to build greater representation around healthy masculinity among BIPOC to SLGBTQI plus males and masculine identified youth. Featuring our amazing panelists today that we are very thankful to have, we will be providing a safe space to explore those topic of gender masculinity for racialized and in racialized community. We are even more happy to present to you this panel has 2021 marked the 30th years of existence of Right Ribbon. We are very proud actually to be opening spaces for dialogue, questioning and growth around those topic. We encourage folk to continue to think about our, our anniversary, not as a celebration, but as an opportunity to examine how our own role in making gender-based violence work no longer needed and in our diverse communities. Without further ado, I would like to invite Jordan from our partners organization, Albion Neighborhood Services for opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth Elisma Meralda. Um, how how's everyone doing today? Um, thank you for coming. I really appreciate you guys coming, taking the time out to be a part of this. Um, I'd first like to thank White Ribbon, Elizabeth Olga for this opportunity and allowing me and my um, <clears throat> and Albion Neighborhood Services to partner with you. Um, as you know, I'm Jordan Crawford. I am co-coordinator of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Albion. And I'm excited about this panel um, that I helped create and help make with White Ribbon. And um, I'm really excited for these this great group of men uh, that we have. John, Jerome, Michael, Jay, and Nick. Um, I personally know each and every one of them, and um, each, each and every one of them are great individuals um, with their own unique past, some young, some older, and not too old, um, Jerome, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, yeah, great men with great minds and even better hearts. Um, I think this is very important. Um, for myself growing up, I never had these panels, I never had um any really any resources to um <clears throat> see any men do it that are doing the right thing um that could help guide me um help have conversations and help me through um hard times um myself i grew up without a father and i definitely would have really needed something like this at that time um so i really appreciate this panel and, and what they're doing um I think I don't know for the the men that are involved. I don't think I don't not sure if they know how big this is and how big of a deal this is. And this is just the start of us doing what's right for marginalized and racialized communities and masculinity in general. Um, yeah, this is very meaningful to me, and I'm really proud of Olga and Els Miranda and the men here. And thank you. Thank you very much, Jordan. And it, it's also our pleasure to have you with us. And it, it has been a very long uh, way to prepare this. And we are very grateful, actually, that Albion Neighborhood Services agreed on supporting us in this, uh, in this project. Um, also, we begin today by acknowledging that we are meeting on Indigenous land, as settler, immigrant, second generation Canadian. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and we thank all the generation of indigenous people who have taken care of this land. Today's panel is based on the traditional shared territory of many nations. 
This recognition of the contribution and historic importance of indigenous people also must also be clearly and overly connected to our collective commitment to bring justice for murdered and missing indigenous women and girls across our country. And it is also important to remember has our, our community, our First Nation community are going through a very uh, difficult time now that we share our support, that we, we are actually committed to work with them and bringing justice uh, for what has been happening also in the residential school. Um, kindly note that we will also be sharing resources in the chat box alongside the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada call to action report. Okay, one thing we need also to talk about is that in the work that we are doing, we recognize that it is important to have the space for youth, um, youth and leadership role. This is why we are very thrilled actually to welcome our youth moderator with us today, John Puyelade. John is currently a student at Wilfrid Laurier University. He's bilingual and studied in French from elementary to high school. Over the years, he has volunteered and worked with the Albion Neighborhood Services. In fact, this is a community where he has spent a, long, um, a big portion of his life. He had interacted with people from diverse background and work of life. One of the reasons why we thought it was amazing to have him actually as a panelist and um, for a topic like in conversation, masculinity and rationalized community. Um, his work is mostly centered facilitating discussion on boys and men issue. Also, he aids in uh, the running of fitness group. John, we are so happy to have you with us. And without further ado, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you so much for having me. So, hello, everybody. My name, as you know, my name is John. Um, and as you said, I spent a lot of my life in our, in our next door neighborhood which allowed me to meet a lot of people from different, uh, different walks of life, different backgrounds, which all can encompass how they carry themselves, how they express their masculine community, and which also put me at odds with some of them. Also, they, it also made me relate to some of them. So I think that this is such an important topic to me. Because I had so many, just because of my experiences, Bringing to, to the table our panelists that will help us do this discussion are uh, Jerome, Jay, Nicholas, and Michael. And I'd like to set the stage for us to open, open to different perspective and allow each other to keep an open mind and respect each other's opinion. So first, I'll just bring the bring the microphone to them introduce a little bit of about them first. So Jerome. So it's me? Okay. So you yeah. want me to just do the introduction, right? Yeah, just a simple introduction. Okay, sorry. Okay. My, all right, my name is Jerome Young. Uh, I am a husband, um, father of two. Um, I'm what you would call a serial entrepreneur. Um, my main area of focus is empowering individuals to manage and multiply money through investing. Um, I teach people how to invest in the stock market through social media. And I also do uh, private one-on-one -on -one consultations. I also do business coaching. Um, I have a few other businesses that I run. I, I was a, once a social worker for about 12 years and uh, dedicated my, you know, a lot of my time and energy towards empowering those with special needs. Um, now my goal is to help individuals build wealth. Uh, Nicholas, can you explain uh, what you do? So my name is uh, Nicholas Woods. I'm a youth counselor from at Rex Women's Center. I work with uh, immigrants and refugee youth. And um, Rex Women's Center opened up uh, uh, the boys' uh, program, and they're able to spend. So they hired me to work with uh, the youth there in the Etobicoke community. So I assist in uh, creating programs and also uh, rehabilitating teenagers through trauma recovery, and also uh, getting the youth more involved in the community. So that's one of my goals to make sure that the youth are more involved in the Etobicoke community, because uh, we know that. Um, it's important for them to stay busy. Jay, uh, can you introduce yourself? Sorry, was that me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect, yeah. Uh, I'm Jay Sidir, nice to meet everyone. Um, so first, thank you to the Albion Neighborhood Services, uh, specifically Jordan and my cousin Jessica for asking me to be part of this. And of course, the White Ribbon Campaign. 
and my mother for raising me. So a little bit about myself. I'm a second generation Indian Canadian, born and raised in York Finch. I grew up in Rexdale in Vaughan. Uh, went to school, lived in Toronto, and now I'm married and living in Toronto as well. Uh, originally, I was pretty reluctant to do this. I didn't think I have much to share uh, or much to give, but I always wanted to see change in our Indian community. So I am I am Indian, um, and kind of to push that change, I want to be a mentor for uh, those young males and like kind of teach them what I learned over the years and kind of what I know. Um, I was raised by a single mother, so my father passed away when I was young. I was with two siblings, so very interesting perspective being raised by a single mother uh, as a uh, minority in Canada. Um, and then further in terms of my career, I work in tech, another area I would love to see more people of color, uh, just uh, people that self-identify as minorities, etc. There's a lot of opportunity for growth, and I'm definitely happy to uh, be here. Uh, Hi everyone, my name is Michael. Um, I am a second generation uh, Trinidad, Trinidad, from Trinidad and Tobago and uh, Guyana um, Canadian. I've grown up in Mississauga, Ontario literally all my life. Um, recently I just graduated from Brock University with a sociology degree and um, right now I'm at Humber College studying uh, mental health and addictions counseling. Um, uh, right now I'm doing my placement though with uh, Albion Neighborhood Services as a mental health advocate and a youth support worker. And um, I'm just really looking forward to hearing everyone's uh, uh, point of view on masculinity and what that entails. Um, Cause I know I have a lot, there's so much to talk about, so much to unpack. So yeah, let's get right into it then. <laughs> so, just try to set the stage. I just want to know what this masculinity to each of you, like what does it do? So well, starting off, I just want to uh, lean it and Nick start off on what his masculinity is supposed to be. Sorry, John, the audio cut a bit. I think that was for Nick. Yeah, it was. Okay. okay. Can you hear me um, better Yeah. Yeah. Um, so pretty much uh, masculinity to me means um, qualities or traits that um, make someone a man, for example, right? But they're not, they're not so um, traits that can be viewed as, as, viewed as negatively. For example, uh, ambition and being too manly, those, like being too, not showing any emotion, traits like that aren't, aren't, aren't masculine. But I'm going to be with toxic masculinity, but to me, um, masculinity is pretty much um, just quite the traits that show that you are a man and in a, and in a, and in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't like, I okay. clear. Yeah, uh, what is masculinity uh, until see what, what comes with masculinity to you? Um, for me, I, I've always told people it's, uh, you know, being a man of your word, um, being a leader, um, being, being okay with, you know, talking about your emotions, being okay with showing um, love to your peers and your friends and family. Um, that's, that's what I really believe being like masculinity is all about. But, uh, you know, I, for me, it's, I come from a Jamaican household and, um, you know, the man is usually the breadwinner and, you know, you can't really appear feminine, but you know what, what's really considered feminine as a man. Like you can be yourself. You can you know do a career. Like I was in social work, and a lot of people looked at me like, "Hey, like that's a female-dominated field." But you know, I, my my goal in life has always been to help people. I've I, I was raised, um, you know, by a very strong mother. So for me, giving back, helping has always been my you know, my forte for life. for that Michael uh, now I want to know your yeah, put your opinion on uh, that question um yeah well uh, masculinity to me always just growing up was just attached to like so many preconceived notions of just how you're supposed to act like think um and just be as a man um and honestly today 
I just find myself trying to like separate myself from like being like that traditional um, just masculine figure, like that stereotypical one that we all um, kind of, I guess, grew up learning about. Um, see, now what I mean by, by that is um, masculinity just has so many stereotypes of what you must be in order to be labeled as a man or identify yourself as a man. And um, just even trying to be masculine could include like um, uh, just different personality traits, like uh, 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 you have to be strong, you have to be independent, you have to be like a leader, um, assertiveness, stuff like that. And you have to like, uh, I guess you have to look a certain way, you have to dress a certain way. And I think just having these expectations, it just really, uh, it really hurt, hurts like a lot of young men's body image for themselves. So like um, just focusing on those situations in life, um, it really affects their mental health. And um, hopefully we can find different approaches to that also. But yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jay? Yeah, so for me, it's similar to what everyone already said. So not to uh, parrot that, but adding to that, growing up, in, in Indians are typically very conservative by nature. It's very role-defined. You're a man, you bring home the money. Plot twist, I grew up with a single mom. My mom had to do that while raising the kids. I'm sure a lot of people have that story. So for me, I didn't have that role model to look up to. Like, this is what a man looks like. First time I shaved, I literally had to look it up online. I didn't have anyone guiding me. So these definitions are iffy it's like you are defined by this a, a lot of that comes from our family a lot of it comes from religion good and bad a lot of it comes from the media uh in 2021 it's very different uh both partners typically work uh splitting up those those the roles of the household uh taking care of the kids household duties the money women are trying to make more women are making more money than ever but it's still difficult to get up there so masculinity in 2021 is very different than 20 2001 to uh, 2011 so i think the definition is changing a lot uh i hope that kind of answers the question well, that was that was a great answer uh from what i'm hearing like a lot of uh, a lot of you mentioned culture or what we learn from our environment so i just want to uh get it clear like how much do you believe that masculinity or like, what we see as masculine is defined by our environment or our culture Jay, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I can start. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's where you, the first thing you learn is from your family. You're going to learn your language, your cultural norms, etc. I see you see your mom and your dad, your grandparents, kind of the definition. In an Indian household, traditional times, the women stayed home in, in India. The man went to work. The women and grandma took care of the kids. They made all the food, etc. Western was similar, but then kind of shifted when the need for both partners to work that changed big time. So it starts with the home and then kind of how we defined it in Western civilization. I'm sure we all watch TV growing up, movies, et cetera. This is what a tough guy is. This is what a, a cool guy is. This is a man with his smoking and dental, I don't know, whatever. Uh, definitely our family and then media culture. And now you can kind of see it anywhere. So I'd say definitely family and culture to start with, but it shifts as you get older, for sure. Uh, I see it. Uh, Jerome, what did you think of it? Um, well, for me, um, culture played a, a big factor in regards to masculinity. Um, I had some uncles that were very strong. Um, they were entrepreneurs, but I also had aunts that were you know, well-educated and whatnot. So for me, I learned a lot from them. I got to pick up on, you know, understanding gender roles and all that from a young age. But, you know, kind of as you get older, you, your influence kind of goes towards um, media. Um, so hip-hop music was a big uh, cultural effect on me personally. But, um, you know, the Black man's always in the music videos and you're seeing rappers, you know, uh, you know, disrespecting women almost or being a player having a lot of money. So it kind of shaped you to think that that's the way we're supposed to be, right? But, you know, that's not really the case. And to be honest, I'm going, you know, going to school and, um, you know, being surrounded by women in, in, a, in, in social work, I, I learned a lot and understanding that, you know, that's not really what the case is and how, you know, you can make a difference. And, you know, for me personally, I think that uh, a lot of people like, you know, don't really understand that. Sorry, man. I'm just... <laughs> Yeah, but you can go to the next person, man. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
you can twist them out for a second. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, Nicholas. Yeah, along, um, I was going to say that um, growing up as well in a, not only a female household, my, my dad wasn't around. Um, growing up, my mom tried to be, a, what's it called, the, the, the dad of the house. So um, she tried to show us that how uh, I'm not to show emotion, always, always work, 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 and be the better winner. But um, definitely uh, as we got older, she realized that um, it's good to show emotion and to talk about our feelings and so on. So, so I think um, it definitely played a role in like how I view masculinity and how in the beginning I viewed it as something that I had to be strong all the time. But eventually with her being our role model, I could see that it, it changed and that showing feelings, showing emotion and all, that, like all those kind of things definitely are, are very important to our, to our mental health and talking about it with, with as, as males. Uh, Michael. Uh, yeah, so just to go off what everyone else was saying, like, um, like culturally growing up in like a West Indian household, I was like, I was blessed to grow up with um, a mother and a father throughout my whole childhood. So the, the way masculinity was portrayed, I got to see it firsthand from my father and many uncles that I had. And I, I think just truly growing up is like realizing that uh, your parents, sure, sometimes, yeah, they can be awesome role models, but for yourself, they're, they might not always be like the best role model for yourself. So you have to go out and like go in media and like find different role models for yourself as well. So I was introduced to many things, but also was uh, blessed to have like a sister growing up. So I, I got to see um, how femininity, femininity and um, masculinity um, was uh, taught to both of us in like different ways. Uh, uh, an example of this could be like, um, just like just like listening to different music at a young age. I, I thought I had to like uh, listen to hip hop rap music all the time because I thought that was like the most masculine type of music to listen to. So like I didn't really like um, show my friends and stuff like that that I was listening to like other types of music that I liked because I thought that wasn't like, you know, manly, you know, manly enough, you know. So that, that was like uh, one thing that I realized for my um, environment around me, but yeah. <laughs> oh, but that's interesting. Uh, what I'm hearing a lot is that like sometimes it can be such an unhealthy way, if I'm correct, right? So my next, my follow-up question to that is like, how, how does it end up that way? How do you push, how, how does it happen to be pushed in this way? Sorry, Johnny, cut off a bit. Can you say it again? Yeah, I didn't catch that. Oh, okay. Can you, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay. Um. So from what I'm hearing from all of you is like sometimes when you're learning about masculine or masculinity in general, an unhealthy uh, way or person healthy less healthy way. So to know how does that happen like, how does the unhealthiness happen yeah yeah where does it come from okay um okay since i'm already unmuted should i start yeah good, go <laughs> okay um so i mean we talked about stereotypes we were, uh jerome and michael mentioned music and whatnot and the best example I use, Denzel Washington didn't win, win an Oscar. He played a bad cop in Training Day. And then Moonlight won the Oscar in 2016. It took that time for the portrayals of uh, minorities in media to change big time. Um, I think it, these are caricature, caricatures. These are stereotypes that are really unhealthy because at the end of the day, who tells these stories? Uh, people say, oh, it's just a movie. It's just a TV show. But is it really? Who's getting to tell these stories? Now we have a lot of great black writers and directors and we need to support that. This is this external. So uh, in film, the portrayals are changing big time. Uh, I love what we're seeing. Misha Green, uh, Underground Railroad, Amazon Prime, like this type of content created by black creators that are telling their stories finally. I think that's gonna change a lot versus 20 years ago where, all right, Denzel Washington, you won an Oscar, but you played the villain. So here you go, um, definitely media. Uh, don't know. I want to see. Uh, I want to know your perspective on the question. Can you repeat the question one more time? Sorry. Okay. Um, so basically, what I'm trying to ask is, how does our views, our views of uh, 
how are we really still masculinity in a unhealthy way of life? How does our views on masculinity? How, how does the does the views of masculinity that we were raised to believe turn into an I don't know why it keeps cutting out. I'm so sorry, man. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, like, it's like I hear a piece of what you're saying and then, yeah, sorry, man. So I, I think John's asking, how do our views of, how are those, I guess, toxic views created in life? Uh, uh, okay. Generally, yeah. general question. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. John? Perfect. So yes, definitely um, movies, TV shows. Um, yeah. Um, just, you know, another thing too is uh, watching Fresh Prince, watching Family Matters, having that the dominant male character. Um, I think that was really big, but if you don't have a father in your life, it's really hard to relate to that. Um, the, le the valuable lessons, I'll give you guys an example, like Uncle Phil and Will, like how they had a, a unique bond and thinking like that's kind of what a, a Black family should be. But, you know, for, for me, like my, my mom was a single mother, so I didn't really have that. But that, that to me was, uh, it was big because a lot of, a lot of our youth today are, are, are lost because they don't have that and they ha don't have like an, a great example of that. So we're basing it off movies, TV shows and celebrities when it should be someone that's, you know, someone that you can actually relate to. I can't relate to a, a, an NBA player because they're, they're, you know, they're millionaires, they're stars, but um, you know, someone that's in our community could be a coach, could be a teacher. Um, th those are really the, the real mentors in our life that we need. So. Um, that's kind of what my experience has been, but uh, yeah. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Michael. Um, yeah, I, th I think this just opens up the conversation on like just toxic masculinity and what that entails like in our everyday life. Um, I know you guys, you guys are talking about media and just um, how it is, it is getting better for sure. But um, I think just thinking about these like these cultural norms that we put on ourselves as men and as young people, they can be like really detrimental to our development as people, of course. But um, if we just think about um, just like uh, the the overemphasis of these traits, which could be like um, just like seen in a lot of films, I guess, like um, even even in some of these Avengers films that are coming out now, like um, we see like aggression. Um, lack of emotion, entitlement, um, sexism, misogyny. Still, um, I know like the, the the Black Widow character um, on the on the um, I think the Winter Soldier movie for Captain America, like on the cover, like the way she was like um, shaped was like she was uh, they like um, over accentuated her breasts, her her hips, and like she was like um, posing in a way that was like unnatural. So like we still see it like consistently, unfortunately, even in some of these newer movies, and like honestly, like these these types of barriers, like um, they're they're instilled into like many many young people too right now, because we get to see them on a daily basis through like any types of media, um, and honestly, I think it just results in a huge form of trauma for a lot of people too. Um, for me, I think it definitely did um, with just watching some of these films and like um coming out of them and like wanting to like act that role because like when you see a, a new film you you end up like uh uh shaping your personality sometimes like on, on some of those characters that you like fall in love with but uh but yeah <laughs> well, that's honestly that's uh, uh nick can i have your you know I think um, along with, along with all of that is the worst part is the fact that um, who we surround ourselves around when we're when we're youth, like when we're kids, um, they definitely play a huge role because um, growing up I was definitely around like um, I want to be around like I guess the word jocks, right? Like and those guys were like the guys who are into sports, they're always tough and they treated like girls terribly, right? But that's what we view as like popular because of social media and because of TV shows that the jocks were always. So like say by the bell, like they're always like, like the top, the top dogs, the top, the, the best, right? So um, definitely uh, who we surround ourselves around with um, plays a huge role in uh, our toxic masculinity. And back then more so it was um, everyone wanted to be like uh, at the top or a jock or, or that. And if, and if they weren't, they were, they were made fun of in school, right? If, if they showed feelings, they were made fun of. They were, um, if they were crying or if they were, with the teacher too much or with, with the, another girl too much they're made fun of 
So definitely, um, this definitely has come on, come into our generation today as well. Yeah, that follows up on uh, what my next question is, which is, uh, so what do we exactly, what exactly do you mean by toxic masculinity? How does that, how do you see that? Oh, identified it as uh, unhealthy. I'm already unmuted. <laughs> oh. So I'll go first. <laughs> I think um, what's it called? Um, like three things on power, like having, like showing um, an unhealthy way of power of of uh, being puffed up with pride, right? Or even um, what's it called? Um, anti femininity, right? Where it's like, no, I don't want to be associated with girls. Like I don't want to have to have any. I don't want them to show, be shown having feelings or crying or any of that and just being overly like overly tough for no reason at all and just mm -hmm. having to show like even bullying for example that as well is a, a toxic masculinity uh jay what do you think yeah for sure so um very broad concept but there's the extreme and the, i guess the micro part so the extreme is obviously say a relationship that's in abuse so to me, toxic masculinity is anything that harms society or the people around you. Um, so abusive relationships, that's obviously very easy to see, not always, but a lot of the times easier to see. That's on the one end. On the other end, the micro side, the microaggressions we have towards females, the anything from role, the duties of a household, anything from in the corporate world, paternity leave, maternity leave. These are complex topics that need to be talked about. A lot of these, a lot of these things were created with, but by men and men in mind. Um, why isn't maternally fully covered? That that's an interesting discussion. That should be. It's very hard to raise a child in 2021. Very expensive too. Um, things. My myself and my partner work from home. We're very blessed to do so, but we have to split roles. Like, okay, I'm gonna cook tonight. I'm gonna clean tonight. I love helping out and I'm not a great cook. I'll help out when I can. She's amazing, but she doesn't always have the time. I sometimes do, and I, you have to help out. But for that, for me, was developed again as a single mother. My mom didn't always, she always, wasn't always around to, all right, here's a meal, go eat here. I'm going to do your laundry. I'm going to do this. You want that done, do it yourself. Uh, that was based out of a need for survival, which I think a lot of uh, colored kids have to go through and a lot of non-color people cannot relate to we have to survive so we have to learn those skills but anyways i'm kind of rambling on but toxic masculinity can be the obvious and not so obvious it's a very complex and broad topic sorry not help out um get involved in your household that that was the wrong phrase sorry for that thank you uh, thank you for that uh perspective um, michael or what do you think about it? Um, I guess I'll say something small. I, I think it can also be seen in a way that we like, um, just how we treat others too. Like um, the people around you, how they treat you, how you treat them. Um, just like common sayings you hear all the time, like, um, you know, be a man, you know, man up. Um, aren't, aren't you a guy? Like, why, why are you doing it, doing something like this way or that way? Like, um, it also plays into like, I guess, gender roles again and representation of what we choose to like, just say to each other. But, um, but yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think we can also talk more about um, those expectations that we see in uh, like, like movies and TV shows. Um, just, just to be masculine, you have to have a source of like income. You have to be able to pay for things. You need to be able to be that person that can like um, take care of things like, like at, as a like like masculinity in general you, you don't want your like significant other to be paying for things like we see that all the time like um because like you see in movies that um if she's unhappy it's because you you aren't you aren't a man you aren't man enough that's why she's unhappy and you have to take care of her so she's gonna find someone or, or she's gonna find someone else that can that that type of concept that we see in media all the time but um but yeah I'm sure yeah but uh now uh, Jerome, uh, what do you get thoughts on this um just you know what male privilege how, how how big it is and how we overlook it sometimes i think that's something that you know we should really be keen on um i also want to touch on yeah because i am married um you know you probably hear people say you know you should make more money than your wife but 
you know, that's not really the case. I really look at relationships as equal. We're equals. We're, you're not better than me. I'm not better than you. Like, I don't need to be the, the dominant, you know, we can be, we can share, you know, like household duties, like uh, Jay mentioned, like, you know, it's not up to one person to do one thing. Like, I, I don't believe that a woman's role is in the kitchen or anything like that. I think a woman can do whatever she wants, but a man can too, right? So, uh, I, and me growing up in, in a Jamaican household, like cleaning is like a big deal. Like if, uh, most Caribbean parents, right? So like, you know, we, sh we share those duties. We share everything together. And I think that's the way to look at things. Um, also bottling up emotions. Uh, that's, I guess that's, that's a really toxic trait that a, a lot of men kind of, we don't know how to communicate our feelings. So we, we, sometimes we just need a safe place and, and being around people that we can share that information with. John, can I jump in and piggyback off Jerome for a sec? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I just want to, amazing comment, Jerome, on that pay thing. So my wife makes more than me. Uh, and I have no issues saying that. People are shocked when I openly say that. I'm, I'm proud of it, to be honest. Like, it's, it's amazing. If you don't support women, in that, so I know there's a lot of young people in the crowd, there is a glass ceiling. Women do make less than men, 80%, sometimes 70%. That's kind of BS. That, that shouldn't be the case for the same work. Push for women to make more because when you do your household well as well, and we as a, all of society improves, not just your household, not just like empower the women to make more and be proud of if your partner does. So thank you for sharing that, Jerome. No problem. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And now we've been hearing, uh, I've been hearing things about like representation and all that representation. So I was just wondering how we choose our role models. For example. Like, what makes us see somebody like on TV and say, yeah, I want to be like him? Or uh, Nick? You see me? Yeah, yeah, okay. Everyone saying yes? Okay. Uh, um, I think um, based on um, how relatable they are, I think that's what that's that's what, like how we we choose our role models. For example, um, Trump said uh, fresh Prince of Bel Air, right? Um, seeing Will, I grew up in a, a household with no father, right? To me, that's like okay, this is my role model. He growing up, he, he's he's someone who exactly like me, grew up the same way. Um, no mom, I'm sorry, no dad, and that's what we kind of view as a role model based on what's relatable and if it's um if we can apply to them like how close we are to to that that our role model and a mentor and if they're a positive influence on us or not makes sense uh Jay? yeah for sure what nicholas said i totally agree uh for myself it was on a personal level it was tough um i was surrounded by my aunts mainly and a few uncles that didn't know how to express emotions uh it was essentially their best advice was take care of your mom telling that to a seven eight year old it's like what are you talking about like I don't know what that means but uh my role model was my mom so I had to look for her she had to be the mother and the father so I really looked to her for that and my siblings I had an older brother younger sister I say younger sister but she's wise beyond her years so I learned tons from her uh I didn't I never really had a male role model and that's my one of my biggest piece of advice to the young people in the crowd try to find that put yourself out there a mentor, someone that can help. I'm happy to help. If you want to work in tech, I can walk you through how to get involved. Uh, find that. So that's in my personal life. And then beyond that, what Nicholas is saying, who I relate to, straight up, I jokingly say uh, I'm a child of the internet. I was raised on the internet. I was. Me, me and my friends were. We were major nerds. Uh, Kanye West was one of my biggest role models, still is. I'm literally wearing his cover uh, album today. Uh, I, my wife jokingly said it's because he grew up with a single mom too. Maybe that's why we relate. And maybe it is uh, Drake, Frank Ocean. These are the guys I really attached myself to and learned a lot from. Uh, that's on the external side. So uh, definitely what Nicholas said, it's who you relate to and how, what their story is and how it can help you. Thank you. Michael, uh, you have something to say about it? Um, yeah, I guess we can just go back to like the the power of representation, um, just like you guys were talking about. Like, um, so my role models go, growing up, like uh, like uh, like Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, uh, uh, Lil Wayne, but like you know, like like different role models like that. But like, of course, like th there's a lot of things that those guys do that I don't essentially like align my beliefs with. Like you know, um, at first for sure, like like Lil Wayne, I wore the baggy clothes. 
tried to put on the chain, you know, everything like that in middle school. But like, you know, um, for sure I grew out of that because that wasn't, that was like a more uh, something that I saw like on a TV screen or on, on my phone that, that I liked. And I was like, okay, this is how this whole masculinity looks like. So let me do that. <laughs> so some of those things, you know, just, um, just how influential a lot of these, um, these characters that we see like through media are on, uh, on, on just young people in general. I think we have to keep in mind like how influential they are. And um, honestly, sometimes, you know, people, we grow up like in, in um, different, different family households all the time. And like, there's different aspects that go into our sense of identity. And we have to know, know where to look sometimes. And there's, there's so many places where you can like base your own um, personality and identity off of, right? But, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally feel that. Uh, Jerome? Sure. Um, one of my biggest mo role models growing up was actually one of, one of my uncles. Um, he immigrated to Canada in the late, in the early 90s. Um, worked hard and just, you know, we, we had a bond through sports. Um, by playing basketball, he used to always take me out and we used to go play ball. Um, and he just really taught me some life lessons. Um, always gave me guidance, always dropped gems on me to kind of teach me and understand what it's like, you know, to, to live in this country, to work hard and to, you know, always be a man of your word. Um, you know, your appearance is always important. So always dress appropriately for wherever you're going. So he always, you know, put some great little bit of information, in, in, you know, to, to me every single time we were together. Also my barber, getting my haircut once a week. Um, ah, man, like, just so much wisdom and the conversations that we've had over the years like it's, he's really helped me to become the person that I am today just in regards to like success and telling me to you know read certain books or look into you know certain certain things in regards to investing and whatnot but also just life lessons I'm um, talking about marriage and stuff I, I I went to him for advice on, in regards to marriage like and I think that was an important factor for me to kind of look at marriage in a totally different way from someone that has a successful marriage so from for me it's seeing someone that you kind of want to be like like you see the the, the the drive the person has and the success but the happiness like happiness is to me is a currency seeing somebody happy and 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 enjoying their life that's kind of the energy that you want to be around so for me th those are two of the biggest influences in my life uh i want to uh i wanted to follow up on that how what is the importance of a of a proper representation of, and then we'll start off with uh, Michael this time. Uh, sorry, say that again. It's, oh, no, it's in the chat. Yeah. Like, what uh, is the importance of a proper representation of, uh, in the media? Uh, yeah, it's, it's like, um, back to what I was saying before, like, um, it's, it's really, really big, really, really big, because it's so influential for a lot of um, younger people right now. Um, like so many times I've, I've seen friends and family go watch a movie and they base their whole structure or whole personality sometimes for weeks on weeks on end of like a certain character that they saw in a film. So like um, they start talking like them, they make jokes about them, like um, stuff like that, um, and speech patterns too. Just, uh, just being able to build that like uh, identity, especially at a young age when, when you're struggling with uh, who you want to be in the future. Can, can help many people just like figure out who they want to be and um, and who sometimes who they don't want to be, right? But, um, but yeah. Uh, Nick, uh, do you have something to say about it? You're on mute, you're on mute. Sorry, my hand kept missing the button. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was gonna say that it's uh it's it's really very important, and um that uh if we don't, I feel like um growing up we leave, we literally um choose who we want to be all the time, right? We based on um what they do, um how much money they make, or or even like for example NBA players, right? We see them we're like when we're younger, we want I want to be like LeBron, I want to be like Kobe, I want to be like Jordan. Right, that's something that we always um strive strive to be, but um we have to make sure that we can separate like um their like what they're doing from their lives and what we are doing from our life. 
right? Because we're not gonna take the extreme competitiveness like Jordan. We're not gonna take um like like the traits that are negative that Kobe and Michael and LeBron have and keep it, right? We wanna make sure that we can separate the two of these people, but keep them as slower as role models in a way. Uh, uh, representation like matters so much. Um, I'm probably the oldest person on this panel, but uh, you know, I grew up on Tupac, Biggie, um, Jay-Z. Uh, Jay-Z was probably one of my favorite rappers growing up as a kid. And, you know, I was related to the music videos, you know, seeing a lot of women, seeing cars and all the money and all that stuff. And I'm thinking that's what it's like to be a man. That's, that's like, you know, the top, that's, that's where I want, that's where everybody wants to be. But, um, you know, as you get older, you realize that's not really, you know, what I wanted. So I, I think that the media, especially for young black men, it puts us in a box. It's either you can be an athlete or you're an entertainer. But there's so many things that are out there. I know Jay mentioned that he's in tech. Like, why not? Why aren't we promoting more people doing tech or more into nutrition? And there's so many other parts of life. Like, the, our, my, my focus was just geared towards, I got to make a lot of money. I got to, you know, have a big house, have a big car. And, you know, I had this whole plan at 30. I wanted to get to this point in life where I'm successful and I have all that. And I'm like, well, I'm 28 now. I'm having like a quarter life crisis. Like what's happening, right? But then realizing like, that's not what I wanted. I, I'm also a nerd. I'm also a nerd. I love to read. I love to, I read every single day. Every single day I read, every day I want to learn something new. So I, I steered, probably going towards college, I kind of steered away from that lifestyle and went more towards learning and educating myself. But, you know, I love gardening. And that's probably something that's not typical for a lot of black men to say, but um, you know, I, I think that people should just go towards what they love and enjoy instead of just going with what the media is telling you to do, especially in in movies and whatnot. Um, you know, be you. Yeah. Uh, Jay? Yeah, so uh, representation in media, massive, substantial. It, it's Im impossible to understate. Um, obviously, we can talk about Hollywood and everything. So at a at a beginning grassroots level support your arts in the city toronto ontario canada as a whole we need to really push these creators I, I mean, we always talk about like the actors and whatnot but also behind the camera the writers the directors who's telling these stories the novelists etc those are all storytellers and creators and now with the new generation you have youtubers and tiktok creators or whatever medium you want to use um but yeah representation is so so important i can't understate it it, when I was growing up, okay, I, I love Batman, my favorite superhero. Always a white guy, always a white director. Ryan Coogler did ba uh, Black Panther, one of the highest grossing Marvel films. Kumail's going to be in The Eternals. I can't understate how cool it is to see a brown guy in a Marvel movie. That's never happened before. So I think this will really inspire people. Um, it will, no matter what, and the types of roles. So we talked, already talked about uh, the black male stereotype. What about the brown male? We had Apu and the Simpsons. I hate to say it. That's kind of it. And every time it was a brown guy with an accent and he was the joke versus the guy telling the joke. Uh, but now it's, you have the Dev Patels and these other great actors that are really pushing their art and then behind the scenes. Uh, and then beyond that, Netflix for all of its not so great content cr really pushes minorities and female writers, brown, black, uh, non-Caucasians as a whole. Uh, let's continue support that as much as we can. So to answer the question, it's super important. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, John, I think there's two questions in the audience. I don't know if we have time for that or like a couple. Oh, yeah, we'll do uh, okay. questions yeah. for, uh, um, from the audience uh, later on. So okay. I'll come back to you. So okay. uh, my next question was, uh, well, it was something that, that caught my attention when uh, Jay was talking. It was like, you said to look for proper mentors or proper role models, right? I'm just wondering, how do you find those proper mentors and proper role models? Uh, is that for me? Start. Yeah. Would you? Okay. Uh, super difficult. It really depends. My advice to anyone young in the audience is find out where you want to go. I, that's super hard. The Canada is the world. It's a place where are right, you're 18. Figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life. To me, that's kind of that's a bit much. Uh, think, just think about where you want to go and how you can get there. I jokingly said, I'm a child of the internet. I am, but so are the, the youth are too. All of you, we're all connected. If you see someone online you want to connect with, 
cold call, cold email, do what you can really put yourself out there and try to ask for that mentorship. And I know that sounds daunting. Um, what's the worst you can get is a no or being ignored, but keep trying and you'll get there eventually. And then for myself, I, I would love to support any youth I can. So if you have any questions about tech and where do you want to go and how to navigate that corporate world, it, it is a bit scary. And especially for minorities, although companies are trying their best with the diversity initiatives and whatnot, it is a daunting world for uh, non-white people, uh, but I'm happy to help uh, with any questions. So to find a mentor, figure out where you want to go and kind of model yourself straight up stock people's LinkedIn's to, all right, he did that. What else can I do? How can I go on that track? That's a cool writer. How did, what's his career? Read some bios of people you admire and how, how they got there. You'll get some fascinating stories for sure. I don't know how Jerome would, uh, would find a mentor. Uh, to, to piggyback of what I've just said is pretty much what he said. Like, you know, you find people, you know, and a lot of people are on their phone. So finding people through social media and sometimes just sending them a message or just telling them, hey, I appreciate the content that you're putting out, man. Um, you know, I'd love for you to mentor me. You, you'd be very surprised that there are so many people out there that are willing to help, especially people that are, you know, in successful positions. They would love to help out someone that's, you know, young. I just did a podcast with a lawyer and he's looking for people that he can, you know, mentor. So there are people out there. It's just really just, you know, taking the chance. But, you know, you we fall in love with kind of people that are I don't want to say influential, but people that are actually making a difference. And we, I think that, you know, just reaching out, uh, DM will go a long way. You know, they may not mess, answer back right away, but eventually, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll um, see and they'll, you know, get back to you. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that's interesting. Uh, I'll, what I wanted to ask is like, okay, how do we find the good ones versus the bad ones? Which one are the one that really elevates you? I think um um based on um like the person's aware like the mentor's awareness of like um their mistakes and their errors and if they're able to like accept it and move and move on for it. Like I think um one of the biggest things um that I had was um having a mentor who was I think he was ten years older than me, but um he was able to admit his failures and mistake, he was able to admit like um when things when things went wrong, he didn't try to he didn't try to what's it called? show like put up a facade of who he is of, of, of what of what like what he what, what what he is or what he can be but he showed me his actual self that yeah yeah you can't make mistakes yeah you're gonna make you're gonna take risks yeah you're gonna make, you're gonna make, you're gonna mess up but that's like all part of like all, all part of life that's, that's that's a learning curve no matter what so i think um when we're able to find someone who is uh truthful to themselves and um honest i think that's when um we can decide if this mentor is good for us or not Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, like we have something to say about it. Um, this has been saying, um, yeah, just really try and push your boundaries, like um, with not even like just new people, with like the support system you have around you too, like family, friends. See who they know. Just um, connections are big. Um, with the with your family, pick their brain. See you see the people they know. And then um, see see what what type of people um, they're hanging out with, and um, seeing if they're they're good for you, if they're bad for you, if they have a negative effect, a positive effect, and like see if you can relate to them. You know, it's all about relating to different situations and really just trying new things altogether. But yeah. Yeah, you talk about, you talk about uh, relating to people. So I would ask a follow up question, which which is like, what would be the bridge into learning about somebody else's life or different, like, especially if you're from a completely different walk of life. Sorry, say that again. Like, uh, what would be a bridge for you to go into, like, look at another perspective of somebody that seems completely different from you? Um... You put it in the chat. It's uh, what would be the bridge to allow others to get insight on people from different walks of life. Sorry, John. Sorry about that, John. Um, yeah. So, uh, just uh, there's a lot of events. Like I know that we are opening up the opening up Ontario soon. Hopefully, um, 
face to face is really big to build connection. Um, but just like what we're doing right now, this type of event is huge, huge for a lot of um, not just younger people, but older people also just to learn new um just new opinions on like um mass not just masculinity but like there's so many so many workshops just like this um through albion neighborhood services through right ribbon that you can get involved with just to bridge that gap for yourself to just put yourself out there really right so uh i, I know that uh uh apparently canada's number one now for most vaccines like given out now which is crazy because we're still in lockdown, but um, but hopefully we'll open up soon. But uh, but yeah, hopefully we can get that face to face back, and uh, you can get 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 uh, get more support systems, get more connections for sure. No response, uh, Nicholas. That's what to say. I agree with everything Michael said. I don't really have anything really bad besides um yeah, just joining um Zooms and uh, being uh, open-minded to like reaching out to new people, right? And be open-minded to learning and educating yourself all, like, all the time. No matter how old you are, you always have to educate yourself. You always have to grow, right? You never want to stay in the same place. So just <laughs> outreaching and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, for Jerome, I would, I would ask you like, how do you open a conversation with uh, somebody that you don't seem, doesn't seem willing to have that conversation how do i somebody that you're sorry say the last part like, uh, opening a conversation with somebody that you know, like he wouldn't interact with you opening conversation with sorry man, i don't know why my audio i don't know no it's, it's not you awesome. saying uh opening conversation with someone that doesn't want to see your viewpoint john was that it uh, well you wouldn't expect to understand your viewpoint um, I'm, I'm sorry, hold on. That's, that's a good question. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that one, man. Uh, that was a really good one. Uh, so, you know, um, I, I guess a lot of that's just like acknowledge, acknowledgement and acceptance, you know. Um, sometimes people just don't want to hear your point of view. Um, but, like, I don't know, like, sometimes you just got to find the people that actually are are willing to listen um you know we're willing to work together and basically finding a safe sp space for you to be able to communicate mm. yeah, I like that answer. Uh, about that. so how do you convince people that have different viewpoints of not necessarily convinced but just have had that conversation yeah okay um I always joke with my wife, so she's a lawyer, so we debate a lot back and forth. Um, it, it should be, it shouldn't be coercion. Nothing should ever be forced. You should be able to convince and discuss. However, that being said, there are certain people in society that just don't want to hear it. They just don't want to hear facts. They just don't want to hear the science. They don't want to hear the data about marginalized people, about women, et cetera. You're not convincing those people of anything, unfortunately, and they will live their life. They will continue to live their life a certain way. However, I truly believe that the best in people in most of society, even the ones you disagree with, um, that doesn't mean getting into a shouting match. Again, that's what coercion is. You're forcing someone to your viewpoint. Don't ever do that. Let's talk and have a discussion, a debate. Um, it could be a friend to friend or a family to fam family to family. Remember why your friends and colleagues though, if something clicked one day and I like this person, I like talking to this person, let's talk like actual, well, I guess there's a lot of students and kids and youth in the audience, but one day you'll be adults and you're not gonna get a shouting match at work and other areas. And there's gonna be people from all walks of life. So definitely a reasonable discussion as much as you can. And sometimes you just gotta walk away and know when to walk away. Definitely. Uh, no, a little bit. I don't know if it's kind of like that, but like, how, what, what made you change your certain perspective? On, well, was there any trigger that made you change your perspective on the top of your head? Or, and if so, what exactly was it, uh, Nick? It's the topic on mass money, right? Yes. yes, okay. I think um, to see how, um, 
how it affects like how it affects you like negatively and positively i think um eventually i reached the age where um i started to think more about um how uh how i treat others and how um if like being being extreme on this side how it affected me negatively and how um it made me view people as like if they were had this had this like judge them pretty much right so i think um even going to college kind of opened my world um to different new new facts of life and different people and everyone just coming from different views and just being open-minded to uh, masculinity and um how everyone views their way of masculinity pretty much Michael? Um, I, th I think the trigger for me was just um, just having an understanding at a young age that not all role models are necessarily role models for yourself and um, role models that you um, necessarily want to follow all the time. But um, the impact that many people that have come into my life has, has been positive and some of them have been negative for sure. Just being able to differentiate like the difference between a good role model and a bad role model um, between those two. But um, that, that was like a big trigger for me just um, realizing um, different perspectives on um, different situations that I don't necessarily agree with. And uh, I don't have to agree with at, all the time, even though like um, you might be friends with that person, it might be a family member. You don't always have to agree to disagree like stuff like that but yeah definitely uh Jay? yeah definitely so um i definitely agree with michael and nicholas so even going beyond masculinity talking about um uh, people that don't identify at uh, um homosexuals and bisexual as well um so as a major example i grew up in the 90s we used to, i won't say because a lot of youth but the g word and the f word we used to say that a lot and i said it too and it wasn't until probably I was 19, I'm aging myself, I'm 30 now, my wife, my now wife called me out on it. She's like, why are you saying that? Why are you, why are you talking that way? I, I was, you're kind of taken aback. It's like, I, we always said that word. We always talk like that. It's, it's just a joke. It's not hurting anybody. I don't know any, um, I don't know any people that identify that way. So it's not actually hurting anybody, but she really opened my eyes and said, it is you using that and continue to use words like that. And there are many hurtful words that you can use continues. And someone said language matters that absolutely does. Um, so that was a, a shock for me. I was like, wow, I was wrong. And I think I vowed from that day, I'm not going to say that word. And another one, not related to that or really masculine, but um, Aboriginals, I really want to speak on that. Uh, my sister, I used to be very ignorant on the topic. We learned about it in school, elementary, high school. I don't think we learned the importance of it. And it wasn't until my sister really opened my eyes and really pushed me and gave me videos and articles. She's like, this truly matters. This is why resident, this residency school is happening here. This is why Aboriginal rights matter. I, I don't think a lot of Canadians and second generation really, I, I we shouldn't, we should identify with their pain, but we haven't. And with everything going on right now, it's so relevant and it really clicked for me. So, so that's two women in my life that kind of forced me, but they shouldn't have to teach me, which is the interesting part. I should be able to learn on my own, but two very important women in my life uh, taught me those life lessons. Uh, I, yeah, I, I rambled on a bit there, but I hope that answers the question. Sure, uh, for me it was having kids, um, having a son and, like having that responsibility now to, you know, be a perfect dad. We all want to be a good dad because especially for me, like my dad wasn't in, involved in my life. So for me, raising my, like I have a son and a daughter, but raising him to be a good man, like what does that, what does that, what does that actually look like? So for me, that was uh, something that really triggered me in regards to sports, um, in regards to his social life and whatnot. Um, I think that's something that, you know, it, it, it takes time. I always tell my son that, you know, I'm not perfect. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no like, uh, you know, guideline for being a dad. So uh, for me, that's yeah, definitely one thing that I you know, continue to work on with my, with my kids is, you know, I want to be a better, the best parent that I possibly can, but, you know, communication and how important that is. Um, and, you know, just being positive. Oh, uh, uh, kind of, into the, the previous one, it's like 
you and your if you were in a position to meet your younger self, what kind of guidance would you give? So, uh, Jay, could you start? There's probably a thousand things I would say, but the biggest for my younger self and other youth in the crowd right now, life. I'm gonna sound like such an old man. Life is not a zero sum game. That doesn't. The we're, we're taught from youth, there's a winner and a loser. Fine, and some things there are in finite games, so like sports, video games, etc. But life as a whole, the journey, it is not zero sum. We can all win. We're literally in this together. I didn't realize that as a kid. I we had that mentality. Yo, I gotta win at this game. I gotta win at this. I gotta win at life. I gotta have the best car. I gotta have the best education. Best why? We can all win together. We could, we need to support each other. So my biggest lesson of my younger self is life is zero sum. Let's all try to win together. I agree. I agree. Uh, Nick. So many things. Um, one of the things I would tell my younger self for sure is just to be more um, open-minded. And I think um, growing up, uh, I had a I had an image of what I of what I wanted of, of being being like the best at everything. Like what Jay said, we, we want why why do we want the biggest car? Why do we want the biggest house? Why do, why do we why do we want that like that? Like is that really gonna bring us happiness? Is that really gonna like like make us make us happy? So I think um I would definitely tell myself that to be more open minded and just and also learn to be content with what you have, right? Like there's no reason there's no reason to do like the absolute most for certain things when you when you're really happy with already what you have. So why why do you have to? like do that so definitely that and also educate myself as i was myself as a kid understandable uh true the biggest thing i would love, love to learn as a youngster was uh keeping things in perspective um accepting change and one of the big things too is um never be afraid to ask for help because asking for help is not a form of weakness I, especially from the caribbean that's how we that's what we believe but it's really not asking for help is actually the smartest thing that you can do for yourself um, to get ahead. Uh, Michael. Uh, yeah, so just growing up, I was like um, a really, really shy kid, really quiet kid. Doing something like this would be like unheard of for me, just uh, speaking to a whole bunch of people like this and having a conversation like this. But yeah, just um, taught us, saying something to my younger self, I guess, just stop overthinking have confidence um, when you're saying something because like the things that you are saying matter and they're for sure, for sure someone can relate to them directly because um, there's so there's so many people in the world. One person's going to be able to relate to it. But um, yeah, just try to communicate when you're feeling a certain type of way also to the people around you, to the support system that you trust. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I um, I want to ask uh, all these advice like to me, masculine, or, or, or our takes on masculine. How do we necessarily convey those things? Do we not necessarily want to be associated with masculinity, or do we see the need to be masculine? Uh, Nicholas, uh, can you start? Sorry, I'm just reading a question real quick. I barely, I barely heard you. Um, how do we how do we convey those things to people who do not necessarily present themselves as masculine? I think um just uh being able to uh um share stuff like this with them, right? This for this this Zoom, for example, right? Just sharing them with uh with the youth that um like you're able to come to these type of things, um telling them that yeah, you don't need to say for the whole thing, but just being just being here and just, and just being mind to listening to things like this, right? And I think that's one of the biggest things is just uh, being able to communicate with them and listen to them as well. I'll do. Yeah, I definitely agree with Nicholas. Um, that, that's a tough one. Uh, their lived experiences is something that we'll never feel, but ensuring a safe space for them and making sure they're heard. That's, I think, the, a major key. A lot of organizations are doing that. We're doing the best we can. Uh, it's not necessarily enough, um, not to get into stats, but look at the assaults against non-binary people, trans people, especially people of color. It, it is much higher than non-colored people. Um, so safe space and definitely um, 
hearing their stories and listening for sure. Uh, uh, definitely um, workshops like this, seminars, um, any kind of community work within schools, um, after school programs, um, and a social media presence. I think social media would, would be very uh, helpful for those that are you know going through this. Uh, and any any thoughts, Michael? Uh, yeah, just basically the same thing everyone else said. Um, communication is always key um, when uh, dealing with this type of this type of impact. Of course, um, there's so many actually uh, for for people that are like uh, I guess uh, like novices to like the, these types of issues. There's so many like free courses like online that you can do on like to learn more about the LGBT community, to learn more about um, anti-black anti-black racism, stuff like that. Um, there's so many, so many resources that you can use. And I think we're gonna even drop some in the chat soon that you guys can even click on to share with your networks. Um, but yeah, just really just getting involved with your community and being able to uh, have these conversations is huge. Yeah. I agree. Um, and then it goes into uh, my question is like, do we, do we sometimes get taught wrong things about masculinity? Um, let's start with uh, John. Yeah, I definitely do think we are, you know, taught the wrong things. And it's not until you're actually an adult where you can make your own decisions, where you can kind of, you know, understand what's right and what's wrong and what fits for you. Um, you know, communication is probably the biggest thing, whether it's with family, friends, um, you know, your significant other. Um, how to change that is, you know, as I said, things like this where people can, you know, take take the information in and uh, utilize it for their own lives. Okay. Yeah, so definitely agree with Jerome there. Um, are we sometimes taught the wrong things when addressing masculinity? Absolutely. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. It wouldn't be an issue today. Um, it starts, Jerome mentioned, it's when you're an adult, it changes. I, I agree. You're kind of beholden to your family and their cultural norms, and that's just the way it is. Or, But you can eventually start to break out and develop your own person and communicate that. So I don't know if there's any parents in the, well, I guess Jerome is there, but any other parents in the audience, but have that open dialogue and safe space for your kids. And that touches on that communication and be ready for any combo and love your child regardless of who they are. Um, and that, that's the truly, that's the best way you as the parent can be an ally for sure. Uh, thank you, Jay. Okay, I'm gonna get muted. Me? Yeah. Sorry. Also, Michael's muted as well. But um, <laughs> you're um, yeah. They we're definitely um taught um what's it called um, wrong uh mas that type of masculinity, toxic masculinity. And I think I real I even realized it like the other day when um my nephew was crying and I said, "Why are you crying? Like be a man, like stuff like like man." And I when I said it, I was like, "Oh my goodness!" Like my culture is like talking from me right now. Like why? Like why? Why am I saying that? So, but just being aware of what you're saying and this also like um, making sure like what, what you're saying to your like kids or if these are your youth, that what you're saying, be aware of what you're saying to them because you don't realize that sometimes just culture slips out and you're saying like the, like the wrong things, right? And it's not gonna help them, so. Thank you, uh, thank you Nick. Um, can, uh, Michael, can you say something? Yeah, just, um... I was really blessed to have like that open dialogue with um with my mom in general. Um just on toxic masculinity. Um I learned a lot from my mother and um and like from university and high school, different things like that. But I think it's important to give everyone a chance to get to know who you want to be instead of people telling you who you are who you're supposed to be, really, because um that's why I kinda hate the question of uh what do you want to be when you grow up? Like at such a such a young age, like no idea. I had no idea what I want to be like when I'm seven years old. Who knows, right? So considering that, the, there's so many factors that play into who you end up being, 
And honestly, that person that you do end up being, you that could change in like a week, honestly. Like when you, like, uh, I, I wanted to be a, a basketball player when I was seven. I, I don't think, I'm, I'm like 5'8". You know, it's like, it's like uh, unlikely, unlikely. So uh, I, I thought I could dunk at one point. No, I cannot. So like, it could change at any time. And there's there's so many things that um, that contribute to what you want to be when you grow up, for sure. So yeah, just always keep an open dialogue. Like I said before, I'm really blessed to have an open dialogue with my family. So um, I know there's a lot of people that don't have that open dialogue with their family, but there are um, a lot of resources also like in the community that you can uh, reach out to. Um, even like us as panelists, you can reach out to us too, like to talk about those types of things. So yeah. I uh, just want to ask one final question to uh, before we get into the audience uh, in the audience. So my next question will be: How do we pick? How do we continue growing and overcome struggles in our daily life? Uh, Karun, can you start off? I'm sorry, mate. All right. So uh, I think empathy. So show you know having empathy towards one another, um, effective communication, being non-judgmental. Um, you know, everyone's got a story and, uh, I think that's important that, you know, we're able to communicate how we feel and to, to people that were, you know, well, that we are like friends, family and whatnot, but, you know, the acknowledgement and acceptance. And I think that's a, a great way for us to continue to grow as a society, you know, and, um, I think working together like, like this, like having a safe space where we can discuss topics like this, because, um, like Jay said earlier, like this wasn't around, you know, 20 years ago. Where you can get people around but now you can get people you know worldwide to, to talk about topics like this and you know it's and it can be helpful for people that are struggling so yeah uh jay you have something to say about it yeah so it's, it's how do we continue to grow yeah to grow and overcome our struggles overcome our struggles yeah definitely um i i don't want to speak for everyone else on the panel i think as uh, minorities, by default, you go through a tougher, we go through a tougher life than most Canadians do. It's life is tough. It's going to harden you, but there's a lot of beauty in it too. Um, you're going to meet people. So post-secondary and then in your career, you're going to learn tons from them. Jerome mentioned empathy. Um, I jokingly say I'm, I'm a film fan. <laughs> I really love movies. I learned empathy from film. You learn from family, you learn, learn from other places, but I, a film is a story or stories in general. You are put in those shoes, um, whether it's a documentary or fiction, what, what, what have you. Film taught me empathy. From there, I explored other cultures and worldwide film, et cetera. Continue to learn uh, both fictional stories and non-fictional. They all have lessons and just do your best. Uh, I, I know that's a general statement. Do your best and be a good person for sure. Thank you for that. Uh, Nick? I agree with what um, Jerome and Jay said. They said it, um, I think they said, they said it perfectly, <laughs> empathetic and um, just uh, being, doing, the, doing your best, right? And um, definitely, um, uh, one second. And just being uh, um, okay with um, struggles, right? And, and, make, and make sure you take care of yourself, right? I think uh, it's very important that we uh, um, do self-care as well. Then that kind of helps our. Cause when, when we mess up, it kind of helps our um our it was to bounce back, right? And be able to and be able to fight those struggles and keep on keep on fighting it. We continue to take care of ourselves. Michael, um, I think I want to just say something about like um just like support systems, like um the support systems that we um create like around ourselves, like the environment we create on our day to day. Um, so yeah, just the people around me, like, I mean, self-confidence is huge, but the people around you should be able to give you confidence as well on just um, speaking on like different things and, um, and trying new things. Um, I think having like, uh, like two or three people around you that can have an open non-judgmental non conversation that you can have a non-judgmental conversation with and not worry about like the aftermath of, um, um, of what the consequences are with what you're saying with them um, is huge. It can really uh, also humble you as well as a person. 
um, just having that type of support system around you. And also uh, just uh, try to take critic criticism in the most positive way possible. Um, not everyone is uh, going to like what you're saying, like at all. And um, just the way that you act, I think, is the difference. If you uh, truly enjoy yourself and um, who you are around, that's what really uh, matters the most in my head. But, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, we're going to be going into our final statements, and then after that, we'll start responding to our questions from the audience. So, any final things you want to say, Joan? Any final statements? That's for Jerome, I think. Yeah. You muted, Jerome. Oh. Oh, you muted. I'm muted. I'm muted. <laughs> All right. Sometimes I just think that, you know, what you're most afraid of doing in life is the one thing that will set you free. So, you know, taking risks, taking action. Um, that's what my final statement is. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. Uh, any final statement, G? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of things. I'm not going to bog the youth down, though. So the most important thing, I guess, in relation to the theme is, don't be afraid to be an ally uh, when you see someone in need. Um, life is tough. It's going to be tough. Everyone has their own story, whether it's uh, wh however people identify. Um, don't be afraid to be an ally. That being said, uh, I think my wife told me this lesson. There's a difference between cancel culture and call out culture. So someone literally called my, my comment out and help, I said help out around the house. Rather than saying, Jay, you're very dumb for saying that, they said, can we reframe, reframe that? And I happily did. So call out culture is much more important. And that's how we're going to learn and uh, grow. And for the youth in the audience, I know a lot of you can't vote and I won't get into politics, but you can vote in other ways. And it's literally your time and energy. Where are you spending that? What do you get? What are you doing with your time and energy? And what, what are you going to build upon? We have a very... The pandemic was tough on a lot of people, people of walk, all walks of life and ages. We have a choice in our culture. So look at what happened with the uh, Me Too movement, everything post George Floyd, everything we're learning about the resident schools, policing in the city and in the country. Are, where, are you gonna, where are you gonna spend your time and energy? So that's my main, uh, not takeaway, but giveaway for the youth in the audience. Ask yourself that and let's build uh, the best Toronto we can, I guess, or Canada as a whole. Uh, such an important thing to say. Uh, pick uh, any final statements. Make any uh, final statements. Yeah, definitely uh, along with the take risk and also uh, make sure to educate yourself and not um not don't 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 be ignorant and not and uh, and ignore what's going on around the world. Like what Jay said about the about the um residential school that's going on we definitely want to educate ourselves and be open and be open to like what's going on and, and learn more about what's going on with it, 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 indigenous people what happened in the past how they were treated uh, all that stuff right so i definitely one big thing is just educate yourself and so you'll be open-minded thank you thank you for that uh michael any final um yeah just uh just push yourself to really just have these types of conversations um push yourself to get like uncomfortable. Um, just try new things, try new things all the time. Cause like, as we saw with the pandemic, um, tomorrow, we don't know what's gonna happen, right? We don't know if we're gonna go back outside. We don't know what's gonna happen. So um, that, that party you said you wanna go to, go to that party, you know, <laughs> get some new experiences, meet some new people. Um, and yeah, just really have the, the difficult conversations with, um, with friends and family members. Um, just like we had here today, because um, this, is, this is not like an easy conversation to have. This is a, this is a difficult conversation to have, of course. Just to, just to um, have that uh, accountability factor with all of us here about masculinity. But yeah. yeah thank you so much. Uh, I just want to thank all the panelists today. Um, I was just appreciated that all of you came in. Now we're going to begin to a three minute break before we go into questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Join. Um, we'll be having a five minute break, three to five minutes.
Hey everyone, thank you so much for staying. I uh, will be having the next round of the Q and A, and then we will also be sharing the survey. Please feel free to fill out the survey. I want to know how we did, and here's some feedback that we can use for our future panel events. And we'll also be giving five gift cards, so please feel free to, you know, uh, share your email if you're comfortable with that. And I'll give back the floor to uh, John. Yeah. Uh, so what I what I wanted to do is that uh, every one uh, panelist should choose uh, one question that they want to answer, and then we'll just go off with that. And uh, we can start off with uh, Jay. Um. It's in the Q and A section. I'm sorry, I, I yeah, didn't look at that. It's in the Q and A section. Uh, okay, I found it. Sorry about that. Uh, they're all open, I guess. A lot of good questions. Okay. Uh, okay. So I see one about um, from Sam. Uh, what's everyone's relationship with sports? From my understanding, sports can be both a super healthy and sorry, healthy and super unhealthy place for men. Um, so thank you for the question, Sam. Sports are interesting. I think a lot of minorities use it as an escape, which is totally fine and totally understandable. We have that win-lose kind of mentality from youth. Uh, and we typically gear towards basketball and, and um, so uh, soccer, as we see. And then obviously outside Canada, we have cricket, et cetera. But uh, I think a lot of uh, racialized men use it as an escape and can it create that toxic thing? Absolutely, the boys locker room, et cetera. I love sports growing up, baseball, basketball. I love hockey to an extent until we quickly realized that hockey is not accessible for everyone. Most parents can't afford 15, $20,000 a year for hockey and whatnot. So in my opinion, hockey is not a great sport. Um, but I guess to get to it, I used um, sport as, as an escape and as a connection with my friends and colleagues and whatnot, both competitively, fantasy, now video games, almost everything. They're fun, they're challenging. At the same time, if you remember my thing on um, zero sum, sports really push that. It's win, lose, and that's kind of it. But that is the point of competition. So that's that lesson from sports, but we can definitely grow as you learn things like community and team players and leadership was mentioned too. All applicable, all truly important soft skills you're gonna need in life. Um, so yeah, sports can be both healthy and unhealthy and obviously healthy in the physical aspect as well, which I didn't mention. So thank you for the question, Sam. Thank you once again. Now I will to Michael to choose his, uh, his question. I'm gonna do gonna do Danny, uh, he him. Uh, what are the three top ways a white man can do slash say on helping raise awareness for their children? Um, so I, I think this is a this is a this is a good question. Um, so just just getting involved, you know, like we were talking about before. So many workshops, just like what we're doing here. You know, make sure. Um, your child and honestly you too Danny thanks for coming to this this is great um would uh, really really highly benefit from like these types of things and um there's like there's five week courses there's six week courses on uh, anti black racism and um different um uh immigrant type courses um indigenous type courses that you can get involved with um also uh Danny just as a uh, I'm a yeah as a father um, just make sure you have that open dialogue, like always with your child, um, just to talk on like what is going on in our society with, um, with there's, there's so many things happening every single day on the news with um, now like these residential schools um, and the, 
I think it's 200 bodies found now in Manitoba, unfortunately. Very sad. Um, that you can just keep keep building with, with your children, making sure they're self-aware of the way that they are approaching things and talking to people um, so we can all just um, have like the best outcome possible, honestly. But, but yeah, I think that was three. I'm, I'm not sure, was that three? <laughs> Uh, I think that was, I think that was three. That was three. That was three. Um, Nick? Uh, um, my Wi-Fi had cut, so I can't see any of the questions. So the only question I can see is, um, because if I'm Jose, I'm going to say your name terribly wrong, I'm sorry. Um, have any of you been in a situation where you are in a group of guys and the conversation, conversation turns degrading towards women? How do you find the courage to speak up and stop it? And how would you advise young people to do so? I think um, uh, um, one of the one of the ways is uh, being able to speak to speak speak to the group one by one. Like I don't think um, I think speaking with a uh, um, in a group is definitely hard, especially with a group of friends because it's definitely hard to defend like um, women is. But being able to speak to them one by one and telling them your opinion of, of why women are equal, why women are so and so, but it also depends on them if they want to. Um, view them as view women as equal as well so because if they don't want to listen and they don't want to view women as equal or view them as uh or people then there is no way that you can like go about like doing it because no matter what they won't listen but i would say definitely try to speak up um to each of them one by one and, and, and get their opinions of why they view women like this and you can share why they're equal and how would you advise young people to do so i think um social media for example future <laughs> he definitely plays a, a role in like the youth and like and all these rappers how they view women as as just objects and how they they're just viewed as um nobodies and um i definitely need to learn to separate um the, what these guys view of women is because uh their view is terribly wrong and they and they view it terribly wrong but they but that's but that's that's your image and, and that's what they'll continue to uphold because that's like who they are right so um Definitely, um, one way is to tell you don't look at social media. Please don't look at social media because social media is not the best outlook when it comes to doing anything in this world. Is is, is serious because the social media has a very twisted view of men, women, and relationships, right? So that's what I would say. Uh, thank you for that. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Jerome, the question. Uh, I see anonymous attendee. Um, how do we reconcile the fact that nobody is perfect and still trying to stay on point in terms of taking away the good? Kobe may be a great role model in general, but he admits to cheating on his wife. I don't think that's healthy masculine behavior. Um, I don't think we should praise athlete as role models. I don't know, a long time ago, Charles Barkley says he's not a role model. He gambles, he fights, he, you know, um, they're just people with extraordinary talent in their sport. And they always have cameras on them and they're extremely wealthy. So it's really hard to just kind of, you know, put that, that, that spotlight on them and like portray that they're good. Like they also have another side. I'm sure you guys have watched um, Jordan's last dance. You got to see a different side of Michael Jordan. We all see Michael Jordan as this guy that's always, you know, he's, he's extremely competitive. He's a, he's a winner, but he does have another side to him. He's gambled. He's done various things where to his teammates, right. Which wouldn't be like, you know, he's not like, the, the the hero that many people think he is right but on the on the court he's a he's a competitor and we got to stop looking at celebrities and like thinking that they're this you know this good person because you know at the end of the day we're all humans humans make mistakes like we, we, we do things right it's you can't put that kind of pressure on people and define that as healthy masculinity right so yeah, yeah uh, definitely uh just to bring in one more question, which is that just came in, it's how do you approach a man struggling with mental health in a way that doesn't shame or push him? Uh, how do you guys feel about that one? Jay? That's a tough one. Um, definitely heavily stigmatized. Uh, the whole, you can't look weak, can't do this. I think the biggest thing is having open dialogue. Start with people you trust. Uh, usually that's family and friends. Uh, there are avenues for help. There are ways to get help. But mental health 
there's different levels to it too. Obviously stuff like therapy and counseling, but on a lower level, Nicholas mentioned self-care and stuff. We're in such a hustle culture in the West, the West as in Canada, America, that's like work, 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 work. I'm literally next to my computer laptop getting emails right now, but take time for yourself, leisure. Don't feel bad about taking time off from work and relaxing, reading a book, going for a walk, doing, playing a video game. I have PS5. I want to play it just because I want to play it. Like I, I shouldn't have to feel bad about that. Um, that's on, on the lower level, but definitely for without shaming, I guess that was a question, uh, having as open a dialogue as you can. Uh, it's such a tough combo. Um, but I think people and organizations are much more cognizant of it now. Um, and that stigma is slowly going away for sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nick? Nick, what, what do you think about the question? I think he froze. Okay, uh, Michael. <laughs> um, yeah, this is definitely a, a tougher question. Um, but honestly, uh, just having that open mind when approaching someone that is struggling with, with mental health and uh, having that type of support and making sure that you're um, saying the right things and um, having, I guess, like uh, just speaking in a trauma-informed practice type way. Um, I know that's kind of a new, it's a new way of like um, people are trying to incorporate that into a lot of mental mental health institutions and uh, healthcare institutions, just speaking in a trauma-informed type way with a lot of people that are um, struggling with mental health. But it, it, is a, it is a different situation when you're hanging with a group of friends and um, say someone like goes like super quiet or something like that. And you're like, why, why are you so quiet? What's wrong? It, it can be embarrassing for yourself if you're the one that is um, shutting down and struggling. Um, and there might be nowhere to turn to in that friend group. Right. So that's why I, um, I always push people to like really try and build that support system around you where you have a non-judgmental, um, just not like really great people around you that are able to give you that type of outlet. Um, so you can talk to them about anything at any time. And um, honestly, that really did help me when I, when, when I do feel that certain type of way all the time. Uh, it just gives me more confidence just to come back the next day and um, have just, just feel better, I guess. But yeah. And uh, finally, Jerome. Both of you guys had some really good points. Um, I find that just doing it even through activity, ask, inviting the person out to like, you know, going for a walk. A walk can do wonders for your mind and, you know, for your, for your mental health. Um, so sometimes just walking, having a conversation with somebody and, you know, sometimes, you know, whatever they're going through will come out slowly and they'll start to talk to you about it. I, I find that to be really effective. Um, you know, I've done it before with a lot of friends and even for myself, sometimes just going for a walk clears my mind and I'm able to, you know, basically speak on, um, you know, whatever I need to speak or whatever's on my mind. So I think that's uh, one big way to help someone that is going through any kind of like mental health struggle. Gotcha. Uh, since uh, Nick is back, I will just, uh, do, do you remember the question or should I repeat it? <laughs> okay, okay. So the question, single question was heard. <laughs> okay. Uh, the question was, how do you approach a man struggling with mental health in a way that doesn't change? Game or push them away. Um, what I've always done is just to assure them that um, what they're feeling is is okay, right? And that it's like it's okay to feel like this. It's um, like it's re it, sorry, <clears throat> it's reassure them that um, this isn't like um, wait, it's not a wrong feeling. Like what you're what you're going through is not something that is unheard of. Everyone everyone has gone through it, and just assure them that like they can um get get um deal with it and they can they can find ways to deal with their um mental health they can deal with their so and so and just assure them that self-care and, all, and all, those, all those things like um asking for help and like going and going to support groups all that stuff is 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 there for a reason and it's there to help them right so that's one of the one of, one of the big ways 
Thank you so much for and uh, uh, Nick, and that's maybe our final question for, uh, from the audience. So I'll leave the floor to uh, to Mike. Thank you, Mike. Um, Sorry, and leave it open. Did you say? No, my bad. I said I'll leave leave the floor to uh, Mike Ripper to close oh, up. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This has been such a pleasure, like one of the best panel events I've attended. And I truly appreciate you folks for sharing your experiences. It's so super important. And I think I always remember the words of Audrey Lord, like your silence will not protect you. So it's really important that we have these conversations, you know, express our, our everyday experiences and how we can make this world a better place. Uh, so first of all, I would really, uh, I'm, I'm very honored by this. Um, to have the opportunity to once again extend my gratitude to Albion and special thanks to Jordan. It was such a pleasure to co-organize today's panel event with you, which is also deemed to be in time as this year is the 30th, 30th commemoration of the conception of White Ribbon. And also a big thank you to our moderator, John, and to you all the panelists for compelling this discussion and all who have joined us today. We want to hear from you. So please take a minute to fill our survey for a chance to win one of the one of our $50 gift cards, 